hold a position high or a covenant more sacred than that of President of the United States. But there is no title I will wear more proudly than that of citizen. You have to live with the discipline of gratitude, that it is a gift we have been given. It's not for us to say when we go and how long we stay, but what we do depends on how we think. The best NGOs operate with a keen concern for people, a deep, profound commitment to good policy, and a political sense of how to do things so that you produce, wherever possible, in cooperation with the government and the private sector, you produce results faster, cheaper, and better than they would otherwise be. That's what I try to do. People of goodwill and passion can change the course of the future. And you cannot refuse to do anything just because you can't do everything. I want to build a world of shared prosperity, shared community, with a shared sense of responsibility. I want people to revel in our diversity and respect it without thinking that we have to refer to each other in negative terms. We're all citizens of this world. Let's build a better future together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank Joe for the introduction and apologize for the sort of halting way that I sashayed onto the stage, but I have not yet seen that film that just showed. <laughs> so I didn't know if it was over or not. But I was ready for it to be over, so I decided I'd just come on out. I want to thank you, Joe, for inviting me back. I'd like to thank Senator Barbara Boxer and Senator Tom Harkin for their presence here and for their service. And I know that State Controller John Chung was here earlier. I don't know if he's still here, but I want to say a little more in a minute about the importance of what you're doing and what public officials have to do. I'm honored to be invited back for this second Patient Safety Summit. Last year at the inaugural meeting, I don't think the foundation was even set up, and Joe and his team had to scurry around here and organize that first meeting because he had just committed to do it the previous September at the Clinton Global Initiative. I think one reason for the extraordinary response is that we all know deep down inside that this is a pressing issue and that if there really are 200,000 avoidable deaths in hospitals every year, it should be brought down to zero and it should be done quickly because it can be. The foundation is committed to do it by 2020. And I'm told that your first partner hospitals produced in their first effort 575 lives saved. That's an amazing thing. With more than 60 hospitals now on board, I can't wait to see what the numbers will be in 2014. At this meeting, about 30 technology companies have committed to share data and to bring down barriers to having their own data available to patients and to others who are committed to improve patient care and save lives. It's also great, Joe, that you all have helped to create a patient safety foundation in Europe and are working to spread the work to Africa and Latin America. I told Joe before we came in, I saw some of the questions he wanted to ask, and his questions were better than my talk. <laughs> so I'll try to be fairly brief, but I'd like to try to set up the conversation we're going to have. 
to, in briefer terms, summarize what I said last year about the way I think the 21st century world works and how it relates to you. It's an amazing time to be alive. It's full of promise and excitement and discovery, and all of us are exhibit A about the good things in the 21st century world. Look around this room today. Think how much more diverse this crowd is in age, gender, ethnic background, religion, you name it, than it would have been if we'd had a meeting like this 30 years ago. 30 years ago, people like me, old gray-haired white guys in suits, would have been overrepresented. Looking in the audience, I'm delighted that you have not totally eliminated my demographic. <laughs> but we are, as we should be, a smaller fraction, more representative of our numbers. But there are still extraordinary limits on human potential in this dazzlingly interdependent world. They're caused by widespread inequality in incomes and jobs and access to capital, education, and health care. All over the world, there's a global shortage of jobs for young people. And it is a crippling problem in many places. And it's no small challenge here in the United States. There's too much instability. We like a lot of momentum, but if you've got too much instability, you have things like the financial crisis or the prospect of breaking into computer networks and shutting down whole systems. There's too much incapacity in the public and private sector for the challenges that are before us. And there's an unsustainability to our growth model because of climate change and because of the depletion of local resources. I saw just yesterday in my clips an article where a, a deputy minister and the Chinese government said that one-sixth of the arable land in China is no longer safe to grow food on. One-sixth because of the contamination of the soil as a result of mining operations and other extractive behaviors. And I could give you lots of other examples from around the world. We've got to do better than that. Poor countries have to build systems that we take for granted and train people to run them. I spend a lot of my life doing that kind of work. We had the most amazing project going on in Rwanda now where, for the first time ever, 19 United States medical organizations, 10 medical schools, six nursing schools, two dental schools, and the Yale School of Health Management are working to retrain the entire Rwandan workforce so that they can be free of foreign aid entirely in health care by 2020. But here's the real deal. For as long as anybody can remember, American non-governmental organizations have taken about 35 percent overhead minimum, 15 percent for American overhead, 20 percent for in-country. These 19 schools are doing this for at least the first three years for 7% overhead. It has never been done before. And they did it to make a statement that in these difficult economic times for the American government budget and for the whole world, it would be unconscionable to try to make a big profit out of trying to help people do what they should be able to do. Uh, I'm really proud that this project is being funded by PEPFAR, which is under the State Department, and it started when Hillary was Secretary of State. It's a huge, groundbreaking thing. It, it, it sent shockwaves throughout the aid community all over the world that this is going on. And we're working with the Rwandans to do it. And they love working with me when they're spending American money because I don't take any. So I'm totally free for them. <laughs> But we have a lot of supporters who are excited by this, who are happy to have us go in and do this work. We have got to build capacity. And I do, it's mostly what I do around the world now, whether it's trying to help 
small farmers. We have 21,000 farmers in Malawi last year that in their first year, we're talking mostly women who farm an acre with a hoe and not a big one. I mean a handheld hoe. They increased their incomes 567% last year. Poor people can feed their countries and feed the continent of Africa, can feed the poorest places in Latin America, and eventually export if we don't throw them off the land and we give them the kinds of things that our farmers had to develop in the Great Depression. But anyway, capacity is the key. Now, wealthy countries have exactly the opposite problem. We have capacity, but it tends to become ossified to resist change. We have to develop the ability to constantly reform, to change to meet problems that occur, and to manage ever more complex systems and to look for simpler and simpler solutions to problems that have deep human impact. So increasingly in the 21st century, I predict you will see not just in healthcare, but in other areas of human endeavor, the kind of operation that this foundation and your presence here and your activities in your daily work represent. Why? Because groups make better decisions than individuals. And the only thing that's really working that almost uniformly makes good things happen in the face of any kind of obstacle anywhere in the world are networks of creative cooperation. In every problem with a lot of moving parts, the more you can have an inclusive process to analyze a problem, take responsibility for solving it, and allocate responsibility so that people are working together, good things are happening. There's a lot of behavioral science which shows that if we could instantaneously here pick the brightest person in this room, which would be somebody with a massive IQ, and he or she would stand up and we'd take them to a nice room and give them all the coffee they wanted to drink and make them comfortable, and the rest of us stayed here, and they fed questions into us steadily for three days. Over time, we, the crowd, would make better decisions than a genius. Working together works. Cooperation works. You don't have to check your convictions at the, store, at the door. You just have to realize that sooner or later you've got to get the show on the road so you come to the best decision you can in a cooperative, inclusive way and go forward. It is the only thing that is consistently working in every environment in the world. So, that's what you are. This is a network of creative cooperators committed to getting rid of the stigma of 200,000 people a year dying in hospitals who don't have to die. I think it is really great that you invited Senator Boxer and Senator Harkin here, and you're going to give Senator Harkin a well-deserved award, and I can't believe he's leaving the Senate. He still looks too young to leave to me. But we've been, Barbara and Tom and I, we've been friends a long time. Barbara's grandson is my nephew. We were just talking about it. He's got an interesting life. He's in film school at USC. I've applied for his first a cameo role in his first film, but, and I haven't yet been accepted. <laughs> he hasn't decided if he's going to have geriatrics in the film or not, you know. But they care about this stuff, and they know about it, and public policy matters. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But if you look at the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that has changed as a result of that law that actually makes it potentially far more lucrative for medical providers, especially hospitals, to reduce unnecessary deaths and injuries and readmissions is moving to different payment systems, basically all payer systems where people get paid for performance instead of by procedure. So that you have a strong incentive uh, to improve readmissions and to improve care and to avoid problems in the first place. 
So I think that's really important, and I'm glad they're here. I know that in every kind of endeavor, uh, cooperation is difficult. A uh, great sociologist, Jared Diamond, has just written a new book. You know, the guy that wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel and Collapsed. His new book is about what we can learn from traditional societies. But he does acknowledge that in traditional societies, people had lifetime relationships with people they knew. And they didn't have to deal with groups like us, where a bunch of you had not met each other before you showed up here. One of the most important things that is often most psychologically challenging is to adopt an inclusive approach to work and decision making. I told somebody the other day, it's remarkable about America, we are so much less racist, sexist, and homophobic than we used to be. We only have one remaining bigotry. We don't want to be around anybody who disagrees with us. <laughs> now, you laugh, but it's, if you think the polarization of Congress is due primarily to reapportionment and the politics of reapportionment, and to some extent it is. And the answer for that is not to restrict access to the polls to some Americans because they're poor or minorities or college students. The answer is for them to show up and vote in every election and not just the presidential elections, which so far has not happened. But it isn't that simple. If you look at county lines in America, counties are not redrawn every 10 years. In 1976, when President Carter defeated President Ford by 1%, tight race, only 20% of America's counties voted for either one of them by more than 20 points, which meant that in 80% of our counties, if you went to a meeting like this, people were actually discussing the election. And they were having arguments with their friends, not with strangers about what was the right thing for the country, who should be elected, why, what were the consequences. If you went to a salon to have your hair fixed or a barbershop to have it cut or you went to a bowling alley to bowl in the league, people would be talking about the election. They'd be on different sides, but they were friends discussing this. By 2004, when now Secretary of State John Kerry ran against President Bush and lost by about two points, very close race, the closest re-election of any president since Woodrow Wilson in 1916. 48% of our counties voted for one or the other of them by more than 20 points. Nobody changed the county lines. We sorted ourselves out by people we felt comfortable with, and we felt comfortable with people that agreed with us. I say that because all of us to solve the problem you come here to discuss and to deal with any significant challenge are going to have to be more comfortable dealing with people who may or may not agree with us, but have different perspectives, different understandings, different experiences of reality than we do. Because these creative networks will enable you to save these 200,000 lives by 2020. When, uh, when I was president, I spent $3 billion of your money to finish the sequencing of the human genome, thanks to the Congress. It was worth every penny. I saw a study the other day that said that there had been $176 billion in economic activity, additional economic activity, since that event happened in 2000. We're in Southern California. San Diego is now the epicenter of human genome research because of Craig Venter's foundation at the University of California at San Diego and now 700 computer companies, not just Qualcomm, 700 headquartered in San Diego because nobody can see a genome. You got to have, uh, there's 3.6 billion of them in your body. You got to have a computer to do anything worthwhile. 
And it's been an amazing thing. Why do I say that? There are some things that the government has to do to be involved in this, and that's one. In spite of all the fights I had with Newt Gingrich, he supported our efforts to double the budget of the National Institutes of Health. We spent the first $500 million of your money on nanotechnology research, the benefits of which are only now beginning to be manifest. These things, coupled with private sector endeavors, can make a huge difference. But I want to encourage you and say I know that there will be bumps along the way and there will be unintended consequences. I just lost a friend who went to the little community health clinic in her village, and I call it a village, in the United States. And she was diagnosed with the flu, and instead she had a blood infection and she died of sepsis from a misdiagnosis. We need to decentralize the healthcare system, but we need to realize that we're dealing with a complex ecostructure. And it's complex not only in healthcare delivery, but also in finance. I personally believe that we'll get this problem with the, uh, the computer system facilitating purchases in the individual insurance market straightened out. But I think it's worth pointing out that 5 million people have already gotten health insurance under Medicaid, and 5 million more would have it if the states that backed out of it didn't inexplicably back out. And it's interesting because, you know, the governor of Texas once joked about seceding from the union. And since I grew up next door in Arkansas and we had an inferiority complex, I thought I would pay his way out the door. <laughs> but <clears throat> now a bunch of urban counties for health care purposes are talking about whether they should ask the federal government if they can secede from Texas and take the Medicaid money. Because, because why? Because they won't get disproportionate share payments for their hospitals anymore, particularly important for teaching hospitals who want to take, poor people want to take everybody who comes in the door and need it for the training of the doctors and for the quality of health care to be delivered in the future. But if there's no cooperation, it doesn't work well. For all the brouhaha over the website and the problems where the states took it on themselves to be aggressive in implementing aspects of this reform, there have been some quite good results. California's done well, and Washington State got to 100,000 new policyholders even faster than California did. Kentucky, Senator McConnell's home state, as a governor and a state legislature that disagrees with him, and they've got a wildly popular program in a state that generally is thought of as a, a red state, a Republican state. I saw a hilarious article where one woman had enrolled a guy in the Kentucky CARE program, and he looked at it and he said, you know, this is a hell of a lot better than Obamacare. <laughs> and, and, she said, I was debating, do I owe it to his civic education to tell him the truth? Or is he so culturally bound that if I tell him, he might run off and think there's a catch? So I just let it go. In Arkansas, my native state, the legislature told the governor, the Republican legislature told the Democratic governor, that they couldn't approve this Medicaid thing. They'd all get killed at the polls because the numbers on the bill were really bad. So he went to the local Blue Cross people, and they agreed essentially for no profit, just their administrative council, to offer an insurance policy that was the Medicaid policy. And he went back to the legislators, and they said, yeah, this is the right thing to do. He said, we don't want the university hospital without its dish payments. We've got to cover these poor people. We can't walk away from this money, and it's 30-something thousand jobs. And they said, you're right. And in our state, which has a Republican Senate, Republican House, and where every appropriations bill has to have 75% of both houses in favor of it. 
75%. They passed it, which meant they had to have all the Democrats and a majority of the Republicans in the state legislature. And the governor got it. It's when people work together, sensible, good things happen. And I think that, you know, this individual insurance market was always going to be a thorny problem. And I know a lot of people are upset about it, but let me remind you, when President Bush pushed this Medicare drug benefit, which is a much simpler thing, <coughs> because it wasn't paid for, the American people opposed it by numbers that were higher than health care. And when they first introduced the website to facilitate enrollment in the drug program, there were calamitous problems. And if it hadn't been for the local pharmacist basically continuing to give all those older people their medicine, we would have had a disaster. But it linked, it got fixed, and everybody's fine about it now. In this individual market, about half the people are in it for less than a year. And 80% of the policies last two years or less. So when the president said you could keep your health care, actually the bill did that. It grandfathered in every single one of those policies. But the American people should have been reminded that the federal government was not taking over the insurance industry, nor was it taking over the regulation of insurance companies from the states. And therefore, these very long-standing patterns might persist. We're getting that straightened out now. But the point I want to make is there are far fewer problems in the places where people are working together, not just the politicians across party lines, but the healthcare people, the insurance people, everybody involved in this, trying to make something good happen. And when you start with the end in view, it doesn't seem to have any partisan tinge. If your objective is to get health care to as many people as possible at the most affordable rate and the highest quality, it leads you in a different direction. So I think you can make this go. I think the medical device people being willing to share more data with patients and with others, that's a huge deal. What do you call it, unsiloing? I love that word. Mostly I hate all these new words, like I don't like proactive. Makes me think I've been active all my life and I was just doing it halfway. <laughs> I don't like preventative, I like preventive. But unsiloing, that's a cool word. And I think that we're going to, it's interesting in this era of the Edward Snowden and all the controversy over what the National, the National Security Agency does, that, you know, some data sharing is better than others. <laughs> but the whole question of defining the parameters of personal privacy and the need for information sharing in your own experience. I think you know it's very hard to have a general set of rules without enough specific examples to know what you're doing. So here again, I think you can really advance this debate. And if you're going to get to zero, you got to. So I, mostly I want to encourage you. And Joe come up here and ask me a bunch of questions and you may agree or disagree with my answer. My answers are not nearly as important as your attitude, as your commitment to this process. Because even if I say something that's accurate today, it might be outmoded 30 days from now. We are really living in a time where information is growing by leaps and bounds, where understanding is growing, and where the stakes are increasingly high. And we're not going to make good decisions unless we do it together. And I will close with this. 
One of the people I've been privileged to know in my increasingly long life, who's been dead a few years now, was a doctor who was a professor of gerontology at Georgetown named Stell Ramey. She worked till she was past 80, and when she was 80 years old, she never had plastic surgery and did not have a single wrinkle in her face. She was an astonishing human being, brilliant. And the last major international research project she was in went on for more than a decade in many countries with many different kinds of laboratory animals, so it'd probably be condemned now. But they were trying to do tests on laboratory animals, give them ideal lives, and see how long they would live if nothing bad ever happened. Good nutrition, good exercise, plenty of rest, no stress. The ideal life for a lab mouse, for a rabbit, for whatever. And they found without exception in every species they tested, at some point, it would just keel over. <laughs> because the heart and brain are electrical instruments and eventually they just quit working and then they in every case, did an autopsy, and in every case, there was no discernible, identifiable cause of death, which meant they had successfully presented cancer or other things from intervening. Anyway, they did this for more than a decade, and then they did a lot of complex data analysis and extrapolated from that the conclusion that the average human body is built to last approximately 120 years. And that to the, if we die younger than 120, unless we are killed, unless we have an accident, unless there is an act of God like the tsunami, or unless we perish from a cancer caused by external environmental factors, to some extent, we play a hand in our own undoing. I believe teaching people to take ownership of their own health care, teaching communities, as I try to do now, to help each other to do that, and then rigorously examining every single system we have to make sure that we are allocating our resources properly and making the most of the assets we have, which is what you're doing will have a staggering impact that will benefit us not only economically, but personally. And uh, that's, uh, you know a hundred times more about the specific subject than I do, but I'll come here every time you ask me because I believe that this group represents the kind of thing the United States will have to do much, much, much more of and the world will have to do more of in order to seize the human potential that lies within people in our countries and around the world, and to push back all those barriers to human development that I mentioned earlier. You're it, you got the right forum. And in this case, the process and your honest commitment to it is more important than any individual position on any particular issue now you will get to the right place if you have the end in mind and you're committed to working together. Thank you very much. <laughs>